get on the setup and everything. Oh, there we go. So thank you everyone for joining us and for those that are going to join us. Uh, today we have an exciting uh, webinar planned for you. Uh, I'm gonna turn it over to our guest speaker from History for Lauderdale. She's gonna talk about the organization, her role, opportunities. Um, and this uh, event is being hosted by Center for Academic and Professional Success in collaboration with SLICE. And so this recording is gonna be provided on our YouTube channel afterwards. Um, and sent to students, but I'll turn it over to our guest speaker, let her introduce herself and get into the topic for the day. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Emilio, Conchetta, Naima, all of the team at, um, at NSU. It's really exciting for me to um, be hosting my first ever recorded webinar. Oh my gosh. The stakes just went up a thousand times. <laughs> I'm one of those people that, you know, I really, like being um, being able to you know feel the vibes and it's really hard to do that through the screen but I'm learning that it is somewhat a little bit possible so we'll see I just gotta you know just go go forward here and and learn these new uh, new systems of communication even though they're not new they feel new because they're so you know so much a part of everything that we do now including at the museum where I serve as the uh, curator of exhibitions um, at History Fort Lauderdale. Um, legally, we're still the Fort Lauderdale Historical Society, but about three years ago, um, we found that that's too much of a mouthful and people, um, you know, have a hard time um, knowing who we are, especially if they're under the age of 62. Um, that's when the organization was, was founded um, in 1962 by Ivy Stranahan, as well as uh, a number of other, Juliet Lang and a number of other forward thinking, um, mostly ladies, there were some men in there too. Um, they founded the Fort Lauderdale Historical Society as a way to um, basically preserve, protect, keep alive the history of the, the city of Fort Lauderdale and surrounding areas, which they had at that time in their memories in the 1960s, they were part of the initial um, foundation of the city and they, they had those, um, those documents and those memories of, um, of when the, 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 the arrival of the first train in 1896 and the subsequent um, founding of the city in, in 1911. So, um, so we are, um, we are a uh, nonprofit organization, a 501c3, and I'm gonna um, go ahead and share our screen, uh, share my screen, just to share with you a little bit about the, um, the history and the website, um, from the website, I mean, including the mission. And as I was mentioning um, before we started, it's going to be a real life snapshot into the life of a curator where you're working on 10 projects all at once. So History Fort Lauderdale, um, this is a, a, a picture of the New River Inn building, and it is, can you guys see the screen okay? Give me a thumbs up, somebody. Okay, thank you, Olivia. <laughs> um, uh, it, this building actually was the very first building in all of Broward County to ever be placed on the National Register of Historic Places. That was in 1972, but it was actually, this, this version of this building was built in 1905. There was an earlier version that was all wood that was subsequently adapted and uh, made into this, um, this uh, building and the end one of the interesting parts of it is the inside the kitchen area is made out of shiplap which is um, you know recycled repurposed uh, you know um, wood from the holes of ships and the bricks was were actually uh, made on site out of cement and beach sand and if you know anything about building you know that they always say you cannot use beach sand for uh, for you know brick making but this the, uh, you know, so far so good on the, you know, on the, um, the survival of the structure from 1905 till now. And this is what I wanted to, because I didn't have the, uh, I don't have the mission memorized, I'm ashamed to say. So <laughs> um, uh, the mission is to bring the stories of our diverse community to life through educational experiences, cultural exhibits, research, and preservation for future generations. So I just thought that that's, it's important um, to know 
you know, mission statements are something that organizations spend days and hours and weeks and months and sometimes even years developing because it requires all of the people, all the stakeholders and all of the board members to agree on and, you know, to really try to encapsulate um, why, why, the, why the organization exists. And so you can also visit our website. Um, there are a few of these, uh, a few of these board members have changed. We had our annual meeting uh, last month, and so about about a month ago, also, uh, just about. And so a few of these have changed as of last month, but we'll we'll get this updated probably next week. Um, so let me just see here. So. Part of our job is to educate young people. And part of our job is to um, preserve what we can of the stories and the history. And one of the ways that we do that today is really by um, providing a space for uh, contemporary artists to provide a glimpse of our shared history from their perspective. So right now, for example, we have an exhibition of uh, community ofrendas, um, over 60 ofrendas um, in various forms. Some of them are in the form of collages, some of them are in the form of painting, some of them are in the form of traditional Mexican ofrendas um, uh, or altares. And so we have a whole bunch of people from the community and beyond that are um, being remembered, people who passed away in the Ofrendas exhibition. And it's open and it's actually free to come and visit the Ofrendas exhibition. Um, it's on our first floor and the closing day will be November 2nd on the day of Dia de los Muertos. So that's one of the ways that we you know, reach out and try to um, promote uh, community building through cultural understanding and um, sharing. I think I can probably share this little short little video clip as well. I think it's less than a minute here. Um, I think you guys will be able to hear it. Hey, we're in Fort Lauderdale to find out about the history of South Florida. Now we're going to meet up with Patricia from History Fort Lauderdale. She's going to fill us in on everything. Let's go. First of all, Patricia, tell us what is History Fort Lauderdale? History Fort Lauderdale, which is uh, operated by Historical Society of Fort Lauderdale, it is a campus of three museums. Uh-oh. And a resource library. Six historic buildings total the most um, significant amount of buildings left in Broward County history. Um, we do a lot of work with our collections as a teaching tool. We have 400,000 photographic images, 80,000 3D images, hundreds of oral histories, and we use those to teach people about the history of South Florida. So why actually is history important? I kind of think it's really important because there's a very unique history to South Florida. First of all, the very unique ecosystem we live in that existed before any of us were here. So we want to talk to also about the importance of the First Nation people and their relationship to the river and the early pioneers who came from European and Bahamas and had experience along the new river. Do you have anything special happening? Yes. This year we celebrate the 55th with, um, first of all, a recognition of Hispanic heritage, which which is the first folks who visited here um, in September and October with Day of the Dead celebration and uh, a special celebration for Francis Abreu, a Cuban American architect. And then we're gonna celebrate the Seminole people with two special visual arts. And then we have a residency by Kelvin Hare, a high women artist during the year. So we do uh, venue events and rentals here. We have weddings and social events and board meetings in the Lucy Bryant room all the time. So Patricia, how can we find out more? Okay, so our website is FLHC org or reach us by phone at 954-463-4431. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and stop screen sharing. So, um, so that's uh, that was Patricia Zeiler. She's our executive director at History Fort Lauderdale, and that that uh, video is a uh, a couple of years old. But we do do the um, the Ofrenda exhibition in conjunction with Florida Day of the Dead every year. Um, the part so that 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 uh, little video was more basically to try to get people to come in and visit the museum, and that's another part of our work besides the work with that we do with trying you know educating 
school age children is to educate the general public. And we do that through guided tours at one, two and three every day, through hosting events and also just operating as a museum from 10 to four every day. And what we found pre COVID is that we had about um, half of our visitors were from uh, the local area from Florida and the other half were from out of state or out of, out of the country. And so when we started doing that tracking, we were a little surprised because we really thought that it would be mostly local people. So that's another area um, that's important for us is, um, you know, uh, a lot of people don't necessarily think about the importance of um, science and the humanities and social studies and statistics on um, the, you know, the impact that those things have on nonprofit organizations, but just like any business, you know, like it is really important that, um, that we have, um, and that we're training, you know, a cadre of, um, marketers, promoters, you know, accountants, um, business people, um, you know, social scientists who can develop surveys and collect the data and, you know, um, provide analysis that can then, you know, impact the, the, the programs that we're doing, the type of outreach that we're doing, where we're spending our ad money, stuff like that. Um, my role is in the curatorial department. And so even within the curatorial department, we have the library and archive we have the, uh, the, the collections of 2D um, objects, which would mean maps, photographs, um, or printed photographs. And then we have also 3D objects, which would be, you know, anything that's, you know, like a hat or a bowl or a pair of shoes, or a gun, or, you know, anything that's 3D. And then we also have digital collections and we have um, slide collections. So there's a whole bunch of different types of objects, each with their own, um, you know, kind of reference encyclopedia that's needed to know how to take care of it properly. You know, the way that you take care of a, um, a book is different from the way that you take care of an unbound manuscript, which is different from the way that you take care of a slide and all of those, you know, it's, it's tough because we're a fairly small organization, but we all have to, you know, be able to, you know, learn about each of, you know, how to take care of each of these objects. So that's one, the systems, um, how systems change over time. So because our organization was formed in 1962, a lot of the early records are only um, on onion skin paper, some of them only handwritten, not even typed. I like the ones that are typed because, you know, it's hard to read old handwriting, but a lot of the records are just handwritten. So it's, it's interesting learning, you know, how to deal with those, how to look through those old papers, because not everything has been digitized, how to prioritize the digi digitization. So that just gives you a little glimpse of the many, many things we do. We get research requests all the time, you know, and so we also have to like, you know, try to get those done as quickly as possible, but then prioritize them with the other thing. Because that's the other thing is, you know, my title is curator of exhibitions, but sometimes I need to look for a photo order, or sometimes I might need to do a presentation to 10 year olds, or sometimes I might need to do a lunchtime lunch and learn for, you know, the big wigs at Wakefield Corporation or whatever. Like what I might, might be doing on a different day is so, you know, you never know what to expect. And so, um, you just have to, you know, be ready and just pivot and, you know, switch and, um, and, and be, be willing to be open. So um, I'm willing to take questions about the organization itself, um, but I do want to just go into an overview of the internship program itself, because that's why you guys are all here. And so, but it was important for me to give you that big snapshot, because the way that the internships are, the way that they've been most successful in my experience is when someone comes in with a specific interest and they say, okay, I'm really interested in this. And what we generally do is we design an internship around your interest because the amount of stuff that we need to get done is like, I don't know if we'll ever digitize all 400,000 photographs. Like I really don't. Um, 
but even if we had like an unlimited amount of time and money and people, which we don't, but if we did, I still, it would still take a really long time. And so, um, we do actually, and I think that you guys might have access to this. We do actually have a formal, uh, internship, uh, something in place where um, you guys can get credit through the history department there at NSU um, if you set up an internship with me and Professor Kilroy. Um, and that's available in the job description on our Handshake um, platform. Um, that we also are willing to work with other professors as well to set up something specific in other departments. Like if you're not in history, you're in a different department, but you want to set up an internship where you could get credit for it, then we just have to have a, a conversation and set it up with, um, with Conchetta and with the, with the professor that you are, well, uh, you know, that you're working with. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story so that you can understand um, of two of my favorite internships that we've had. Actually, there's three. There's, um, but I'm going to tell you these two uh, first because they're both. Um, one of them was an undergraduate, and then the other one was a graduate. And so, um, I, I, um, the the most recent one uh, internship that we had was uh, fall of last last year? No, I think it was the year before last, right? Because it was 20, uh, we were preparing what I needed. I wanted help. I was tr really trying to find someone to help me with. Um, we wanted to do a special exhibition for the um, 100th anniversary of the end of um, World War One, So 2018. And we had, we had, we have, we, it's not up now, but at that time we had a permanent exhibition about World War I, um, but it was a little like old and, you know, it had been put up 25 years ago and it didn't really talk about the role of um, any of the soldiers of color from World War I, which there were several from this area. And so that was what I wanted help with was to see if we could find, you know, dig up information on these, on, on these, um, you know, um, soldiers of color who, who, who served in World War One. And there's a bunch of people, um, that, veterans that are buried in Woodlawn Cemetery um, near by where I live in Sistrunk. And um, so I knew, like, I mean, you can see their gravestones, their headstones, it says what, if they're World War One vets. So I'm like, you know, why don't, why don't we have information in re relationship to this exhibition um, that ties, you know, that tells the stories of these people. So that's what we were trying to do. And lo and behold, I got a call from a gentleman from FIU. He was doing his master's degree in public history. And um, he, he was looking for a place to intern and his, um, his professor wanted, you know, wanted him to be able to do an actual project and, um, you know, make it publicly available. And I was like, well, that's a perfect fit because that's exactly what we need. So um, I asked him, you know, how many days a week can you come in? Um, how often, how many hours does your internship need to be? And so we designed the program of what his, you know, needs and availability was. And so he agreed he was going to come in every week on a Thursday from whatever time it was. And so that's how we started out. And so I showed him um, all the resources that we have available, how to search them, how to, you know, handle the photos properly, all of that. And so he did, he did the research to try to figure out if we had records on those, um, those soldiers. Um, and then, you know, we also looked, went out and looked at the gravestones, got information about those. And what, in the end, what we ended up doing is we had, um, on Veterans Day, um, November 11th, 2018, we had a bunch of the, um, uh, the guys from the, the Legion came over. The city had its Veterans Day um, presentation over uh, about a block down from where we are near Esplanade Park. And then they came over to the museum and viewed the exhibit. And, you know, many of them were seeing it for the first time, even though it had been up for quite some time already. And so that worked out really nicely. And then he, um, uh, Mr. Polito even went a step further and he created an online. So that was actually before COVID, our first online exhibition he created. So he basically took all the information that we, you know, that, that we found that he was able to research um, and then he put it into an online format. So that's somewhere, um, that's available somewhere on our, on our website as well, um, historyfortlauderdale.org. I think it's under um, visit or exhibits. I don't know, we can go look at it later if we have time. 
but um, so he, you know, it took a little longer to, to go that extra step, but um, I, I'm, I'm really glad he did because it's, it's really nice that, especially now that the permanent exhibition has been removed now, at least we can do that, the online version. So I think that he, you know, he really enjoyed um, his experience, you know, working with us. And then, you know, some of it, when he got into the online part, that part was done, um, uh, you know, on his own time, like, you know, from his, from his home. And so we're open to that as well. You know, there's a lot of work that can be done remotely. There's some things that can't be, but there are a lot of things and contributions that could be uh, made um, via remote remote work so we're you know we're definitely um within our organization we're definitely factoring that that avail that availability and especially now with covid um the other uh internship case study if you will um that i would like to tell you about is um bailey per perlman ba bailey was an undergraduate student um, again in history um, she was going to the University of Delaware and she, her classes didn't start until like February 1st. And so she called us up in November. She was like, hey, I'm for, from Fort Lauderdale. I'm going to school in Delaware. I have January off and I would like to do an internship. And I was like, oh, well, that's different. Okay. <laughs> you know, how many, you know, when would you like to come in? What's your availability? What, you know? And so we went through, you know, similar process with her. She was like, well, I can come in this time to this time, Monday, Wednesdays and Fridays, but only for January. So I'm like, okay, you know, what could someone get done? You know, what's something that someone could get done that I need help to prepare for that could be done within this amount of time that she has available. And I was like, you know, every, you know, every MLK day, we do this, you know, um, this community outreach, and, you know, we go out and we participate in the Fort Lauderdale MLK day, it's outside, you know, every year, I, I have to try to get someone to help me. But, you know, one thing that's missing from our uh, um, presentations that we do to the schools and everything is, um, what was happening, you know, like even when I, you know, what I, when I would watch my, my children at school, when they would study, uh, you know, black history, it didn't, it, what was missing was what was happening here in Broward County during the civil rights movement, you know, what's the local history that relates to, you know, these iconic national figures that we all read and hear about. And so that was her project. She researched what did we have available within our collections that related to the local civil rights movement. And um, she put it together in a PowerPoint presentation. And, you know, we've been using it to present to, um, uh, to elementary schools and high schools ever, you know, ever since. And so she was able to, you know, do the research, create the PowerPoint, you know, in consultation with me, you know, in terms of the, you know, the, the type and learning, like, um, she wasn't an education student, which would have been great if she was, but she was a history student. So she had to learn about how do you, you know, um, create a lesson plan or a presentation that's geared for that, you know, that age, um, that, you know, third to third to seventh grade um, audience that we were that we were going for. But, you know, she, um, she enjoyed her time as well. She came in, she did her research. Um, you know, again, we had to show her how to look through the documents that we had available. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, I think she was really happy uh, with with how it turned out and with her experience. In fact, um, I think she might be starting grad school now uh, to do her master's in history uh, this this fall, I, I believe. So she, we've stayed in contact and, you know, every time she needs a reference letter, I get the request. So I do it. And <laughs> it's a, a little bit extra work for me, but it's well worth it because it's, it's really part of it is really um, thinking ahead about, you know, who who are the people that I will be able to rely on in the future, you know, to be my colleagues, to, you know, eventually replace me when I'm ready to retire in 20 more years, maybe. <laughs> so, um, so that's, that's part of it. Um, there was one more um, intern that we had, and this one was a high school student. Um, and her name escapes me at the moment, but what she was interested in doing was blogging. Actually, we had two high school interns. One was a photographer and one was a blogger. And I was like, you know, I'm like, do we really need a blogger? And I'm like, yes, we need a blogger from the perspective of a high school student because that's the peop that's the age group that 
is least likely to visit our history museum is the teenagers. And they're the ones who really, who we need to cultivate that interest in nonprofits and history. And so, um, so that's what she did. She came to every event for a year and she wrote a, you know, two to 400 word blog about it with some pictures. And it was blogs unlike any that we had ever, you know, considered before because it was from her perspective. And so um, that's the beauty I think of having, you know, having interns is, you guys get to learn about um, all the many facets of, of, you know, of the nonprofit industry, of the history museum, of the tourism sector, of the event rental venue, all, all you know, all of that, whatever the, the interest is. And even now there's this, the whole health, you know, the whole added health issue, you know, we have to have someone at the door taking temperatures all the time. Like I never thought we would see see this day in my lifetime, but you know, the whole public health issue is a major, uh, now a major operational aspect within our, our organization, you know, maintaining how many people we're supposed to have in each room. It's really, you know, it's really interesting how, how things are changing. But um, so there's, and all of that is really just really a teeny tiny tip of the iceberg kind of overview to try to give you an idea of some of all the many different facets that there are. So I am so bad at multitasking. I don't know if there's chats. I don't know if there's questions, but I'm gonna pause now and see if you guys have any questions or you know, um, you know, whatever our next steps are. I know that was a way lot of information, but um, I'm willing to you know backtrack or go back over anything or go back over to the website if you like, but I'll just pause here and see, check in with everybody. And you can, um, if you have a question, you can feel free to unmute your mic and ask it. Because, yeah, I, I can't, I'm sorry, I can't do the chat and the presentation at the same time. I'm just, my brain is not that multi-talented. <laughs> Janae Joseph. Oh, Janae. Hi. I know this lady. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, you did, uh, you did, uh, about four years ago, you, um, you interviewed me for a project. We did a phone interview, and then you even sent me a transcript. Was that you? Are you a teacher? Um, Maybe not. Maybe it's someone else with the same name. Probably. <laughs> um, but, Sorry. Uh, yeah, there, but there was, that was, that wasn't an internship, but that was a lady who was, um, she was doing some kind of project. She's, she was a, a middle school teacher and she was doing a project about education. And so she interviewed me for her project and, you know, to see how do we integrate, you know, education within a museum setting. And it was, it was really, that was really interesting. Cause then, you know, like mine was just one of several interviews and then she put them all into a paper and then she sent me a copy of it. And that was pretty cool. What was the teacher's name? Janae Joseph. It wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think you would remember. <laughs> yeah, um, but I'm a junior. I'm also a history major, so I'm kind of wondering of like um, what other steps has um, History Fort Lauderdale taken like during this time of COVID for people to work remotely and like how does a museum, you know, operate during this time when like, you know, there's so many precautions that have to be put in place. Like, how do you guys get work done? Yeah, that's a really great question. And it's, it's so, I mean, obviously we were shut down for two months, just like everyone was. But during that time, our executive director and our operations director still came to work every day because someone had to check and make sure that the air conditioning stayed on. Someone had to make sure that, you know, like the, the artifacts were safe, you know. And so um, there are a lot of things that have had to go slower than normal like for example like there's I don't know if she's on the call if she is I hope she doesn't get too mad but there's there is a librarian at NSU that's been wanting to come in and do some research and you know about a specific thing and it's just like we always take research appointments but right now we have to schedule the research appointments so far apart you know like there cannot be more than three people in a room and the librarian is like you know very old and so she just started coming back to work once in a while too and so um it's it's 
there's so like on a normal day in the museum, there's so many spinning tops of things to think about and 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 you know work with. But now with COVID, it just makes it a whole nother level. So um, so I'm one of the few people that are regularly working from home, but still, you know, like in uh, in the preparation of installing the um, Ofrendas exhibition, I had to be on site every day for like four days, like 12 hours straight a day, because, you know, there's some things that just cannot, they can't be done from home. Like there's research, I can, you know, do all the, um, you know, applications, articles, you know, research, if it's online based, all of that can be done from home. But if it's research with a photograph or, you know, one of the, um, you know, the letters, you know, hundred year old letters or, you know, like, like it, our, our library is not a lending library. Like, you know, all of our collections and our uh, manuscripts and our books, you have to only the maps, you can only look at them on site. And um, sometimes, you know, like digitization can sometimes dam damage things. So not every artifact is a candidate for being able to take a digital photograph of. So, um, so it's, yeah, it's, it's been it's been something and you know a, a large part of our education component is usually field trips you know and there's very few field trips you know like Broward County Public Schools there's no field trips this year and yeah. so we've been trying I've been trying to learn these digital platforms because there are virtual field trips and so we had our first virtual field trip um, a couple weeks ago and so I had to you know learn the teams app and you know get <laughs> learn how to sign on and so they're doing you know uh, you know all of my colleagues and all the other fields that we work in are also doing their best to pivot and adapt and so you know for the first time we're intentionally making um uh virtual experiences part of our exhibitions you know and that's had to happen you know like we always do like a Facebook live stream or whatever but that's different from intentionally trying to provide a digital experience for people who you know would normally be considered our in-person audiences and now you know because of COVID we're trying to make every experience accessible on a on a digital platform you know and not just as an add-on or a glimpse in case if you didn't want to make it down but as something that you could actually use to experience an, an exhibition and you know it's not that it's something new uh, because you know these i have been you know we've been trying to deal with these ideas for some time you know like thinking about touch screens or but it's just a whole nother reality to try to realize that this has to be like always thinking that we could get shut down at any time again and digitization or digital platform might be the only way that we can you know that we can communicate that we can educate that we can um you know try to inspire uh you know community building and history and preservation and all of those things and so it's just oh my gosh like one of the first things that I did, like we had our, um, we had our uh, right during the shutdown is when we had our Women's History Month exhibition, which, you know, like was uh, photography, women's photography, but also thinking about the, um, the, uh, the hundredth anniversary of the, the women's right to vote, the 19th amendment. And so the very first thing I did was, um, took a PowerPoint that was made to be a, a, an in-person presentation and attempted to adapt it for video. So I spent like three weeks trying to figure out how to adapt this, you know, 20 page adult level PowerPoint into a video. And it was, you know, I mean, I had some video training back in 1990 something, but you know, that was with the VHS and a, <laughs> and a hmm. splicer. <laughs> so it was, um, it's been quite a journey to try to figure out how do we keep working and you know the work doesn't go away you know the artifacts still need to be reported on but um um oh you know sometimes my um i hope that it's not my uh, internet because sometimes the internet is a little wonky but um hopefully you guys can hear me okay 
if I do freeze or something, somebody like give me the airplane X sign or something so I can reload. But yeah, so and then there's, you know, like you had seen when I when I when I showed you my screen, there's like endless, you know, the, the good part is everything is like all of our grant proposals, you know, all of our, um, you know, um, uh, article writing, um, there's you know, there is a lot that is digital anyway, that normally I would have just been doing from my, you know, from my workstation um, at our office. So I can, you know, I can write grants, I can report on grants, I can do all of that from, from, you know, from here, um, uh, or from wherever, as long as I have that, that Wi Fi. So that's one thing that, um, that really um, has been easy to, to adapt to. And then we're not even going to talk about the two kids that are hopefully in their classrooms, in their <laughs> in their workspaces right now, including the nine year old that sneaks out whenever he can. <laughs> you know, like that's a whole nother level of, you know, how do you keep going? That I'm sure that you know everybody that has kids around uh, is also going through. And I have another question. It's specifically on the virtual tours. Um, do you film them yourself as like one person or is there like a team that kind of works behind the scenes on it and like someone's presenting? Well, the idea of recorded, like, so, so the thing that I've learned out of this pandemic is that there's a big difference that I didn't really, um, like I knew, but I didn't really give it much thought before between the live streams. For example, like, I was always one to try to live stream our openings, even if it was just a little clip, even if it wasn't, you know, if, even if it was just from my old Blackberry with buttons, <laughs> but you know, um, because at that time, I, I just know that for me as a mom, you know, there's a lot of things I would like to attend and I just, you know, the time that it takes to get there and the parking and, you know, like, I just don't always have time to do things, but it, but I would like to, you know, see it, you know, I would like to experience it somehow, but that's, you know, that kind of giving people a glimpse just so that they can glimpse is so different than giving people equal access as much as possible via digital platform, you know, that to me requires, you know, a real video camera and, you know, um, you know, someone who actually knows something about shot composition. And so, I mean, I guess the answer is whatever is possible. Now for the virtual tours through Beacon TV, what they, so, so what we've done over the last three to four years is we've um, committed to do more or less roughly monthly presentations that are available to all Broward County public school employees. And all they have to do is sign up through the Beacon Distance Learning Program. And so this year, normally how we do that is a crew from Beacon comes, a cameraman, a guy with a big fancy thing that connects the camera to their online delivery system <laughs> that pipes yeah. it into the schools and a lady who's like the coordinator coach you know the person who tells me when my time is up or whatever so they usually bring a three-person team to the museum and then there's me and you know if I have a co-presenter or someone that I'm interviewing or whatever and um, this year now it's me you know talking to the coach having her you know figure out how to for me to sign up into their teams thing that's through the that their teams app that's through the um through the uh the school district and me and my little laptop which is what i'm you know with the j5 create you know plug-in camera because my laptop didn't you know i, I opted for the mm -hmm. laptop without a camera because cameras usually freak me out but, <laughs> but you know i had to go buy the the plug-in um and so, uh, so with now with the, you know, the, the virtual tour for through Beacon, now it was me, you know, walking my, yeah, it was me walking this, this laptop around the, the Ofrenda exhibition to give the kids a little tour. And so it's, yeah, it's a completely different now. 
Now those are not recorded. Those are again, kind of like an interim between the giving people a glimpse so that they can see what it's like, you know, Facebook lifestyle and a recorded, you know, tour. So ideally I would like to have, um, you know, a four person crew, you know, camera A, camera B, sound person and coach, you know, um, you know, filming me um, to do uh, an actual virtual tour and then editing it, you know, according to how I wanted and then, you know, full production video. That would be my ideal. But, you know, video production is usually about a thousand bucks a minute and a tour would take, you know, I mean, even if I did a mini tour, it would at least take 20 minutes. So anyway, so that's, that's a whole nother area to think about for budgets. But with museums, you know, most of our budgets, you know, we're writing grants now for 2022, 2023, you know, like, I mean, so it's been interesting this year to try to figure out how to do that, you know, that pivot. Mm -hmm. And then of course your whole team, you know, your financial team, your administrative team, your, your board members, like everybody has to have that same vision. And so right now it's a matter of, you know, like, Oh, so where do we put our priorities? Do we create new in-person exhibits or do we, you know, I don't know. It's, I mean, and knowing that the economy is going to be different, you know, going forward for the next little while, no matter what it's, I mean, it's, there's a lot to think about, you know, there's a lot of things to, to think about um, and strategize about. Yeah. And, um, I don't know if I answered your question. But <laughs> yeah, it pretty it pretty much did because also like I have a minor in digital media productions. Oh wow! And I'm kind of like trying to fine tune like my videography skills and whatnot, and it's been kind of hard to you know especially do it in this climate because um, you know you can't really you know film any videos or shoot anything safely right now, but of course like next year would be different so um with some of the issues that you were having with like digitizing um the collections within the museum or even virtual tours um I just want to see if there's like any way that I can possibly help with that you could like, definitely help I mean with your skills history and you like you are so perfectly positioned for this moment in the world history <laughs> it's amazing you could definitely help. I mean, there's so, you know, there's so, so many, so many ways because, you know, like what we found by looking at our website analytics and, you know, setting up a YouTube page a few years ago and looking at those analytics is most people, when we post a video, whether it's on Facebook or Instagram or um, Twitter or YouTube, um, most people will watch for about two, two and a half minutes, no matter how long it is, you know, like, the, but that's usually the amount of time that people will spend on average, you know, like, even if it's like a 10 or like, like the women's suffrage presentation, it was like 20 minutes. I'm like, who's going to sit there and listen to 20 minutes. But yeah. I was like, but I have like, in order to meet the requirements of this grant, I need to do something. So I just, you know, but it was an experiment and you know like I mean I guess that's just what we have to do is just try things and see how they work and be brave and you know learn learn and adapt and you know just try to keep going that's that's what I've been trying to do anyway I actually yeah. have a question then for for you as well Tara because it sounds like we have some interesting some people that are interested in getting internships with History Fort Lauderdale how does a student apply for your internships or get an to get into that process or how do they sign up for volunteer opportunities with you or with the museum itself? That's a great question. Thanks, Olivia. So there is actually, uh, we have, um, there's this thing called Handshake and you can apply through there. And like, if, if you apply through there, it'll send, uh, it'll send me or a copy of your resume and then that's how I'll know you're interested. Or you could also just email me. <laughs> like, I don't know what the, you know, uh, like I think in order maybe to uh, get the, you know, credits or hours or whatever it is that's needed. Naima, are you going to help me out here? Thank I you am. so I didn't much. Wanna <laughs> I didn't want to interrupt you. That's why I was going to, I was going to come in. 
So um, being that this is a unpaid internship, of course, um, which is totally fine. We always encourage our students, um, you know, to look out for opportunities that they are able, you know, to receive experience. So once, what a student will do is if they find an opportunity or if they just come to you, sometimes they may skip us. Um, Handshake is our online career platform. So all of our career advisors, um, our staff have access to it. All of our students have access um, to apply for opportunities. But if they say, okay, well, I want to receive academic credit, we just always tell them to come, come to career um, or CAPS. Uh, but what we do from there is that um, there's a portion that the academic, the academic advisor um, completes, just making sure that the student make, has the GPA for their particular college. Um, and then what happens after that is um, a career advisor signs off. So they vet the opportunity, make sure that the location is at a safe site. Of course, we know history of Fort Lauderdale. Um, is safe. Right now, we are approving virtual career, um, virtual internships just because of the, pan the pandemic in the past. We had not, but we are approving them um, now, and we are in contact with our um, colleges on campus to let them know that, you know, we are approving virtual internships. Um, our, our point from the employer relations side, we just vet the employer to make sure that the employer is a legit employer, um, that they actually do have a commercial location. Although the opportunity will be taking place remotely, they the organization still has to have a commercial um, location. And then finally, once we um, vet that, then we send the information off to the academic contact um, for that college. The academic college has the final say. Um, the history contact is Dr. Kilroy, so he has the final say. He'll look at the job description, make sure that, of course, what's the details in the job descriptions um, in correlation to the student's academic progress, and then he'll um, he will approve. So that's that's how that goes. And if he's missing anything, you know, he'll always follow up. Hey, you know, can they provide um, additional information? So we like to tell the employee and the student, okay, you need an offer letter. You say, well, what's supposed to be an offer letter? And we provide guidance on you know the details. So I. Um, a summary of what they'll be doing, you know, um, the requirements of the job as well, as well. So, yeah. So it's pretty easy. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. You. But if you ever have any questions or you get any students, you know, from NOVA and they say, hey, I want to, you know, apply for academic um, credit, just having to reach out to our, to our office. And awesome. all we ask the employer to do um, is just submit an offer letter. Nice. Very good. Thank you. You're welcome. Are there any additional questions for Tara? And we have a great relationship um, with our College of Arts, Humanities and, and Dr. Kiro. He's, he's always looking to build those relationships and provide um, great opportunities for our students. Any additional questions for Tara? Well, I hope that you guys will apply. <laughs> and I hope some of the other people that watch this video later will um will apply um there is just one little uh personal note that i wanted to add too is that you know like even though that right now you know this this is an unpaid internship opportunity but you know when uh when when ms butler was talking about the process it made me think about my beginning uh times at museums and my my first time working at the museum was actually when i was uh, in high school, I worked for the St. Catharines Historical Society as the fundraising mascot. <laughs> so I went to all the events and, you know, learned about how important it is to engage your community. And the St. Catharines Historical Society was able to fundraise enough money and get enough, you know, political um, uh, buy-in in order to create a full-fledged uh, what's now the St. Catharines Museum and Well Welland Canal Visitor Center. And so, you know, those, those experiences the the experiences that I, that I've learned over the years since then, you know, in paid and unpaid, um, you know, opportunities ha has really uh, been the foundation of my ability to to do this job, you know, to problem solve, to be creative, to you know, know what the basics are about you know muse museology really, and so um, really the um, the the learning like I think muse the museum field is something that is really um, you learn a lot by apprenticing and so you know I just want to encourage you in that way that you know I I know sometimes we can't take jobs that don't you know that don't pay but if you have that ability um, the learning that you will uh, that you will acquire and the experience is really priceless. Yeah. 
Absolutely. And that's something we always encourage our students, um, you know, to do as well. Like you mentioned, if they can't, you know, we can't control that. But oftentimes we like to work with employers. Compensation can come in many, you know, forms. I had a student to um, get a great opportunity. The employer wasn't paying, but she was able to negotiate a gas stipend and like they fed her lunch, you know, every day. So again, uh, you know, don't dismiss an opportunity because you don't like the way it's, you know, dressed. Um, but, you know, there are ways, again, that we advocate for students. We chat with employers. You know, the student does have to, you know, uh, you know, transportation is an issue for them. They can get there, but, you know, gas can be expensive. And you'll be surprised, even some of the smallest organizations, um, they can say, well, you know what, we can afford to do a $25 a week stipend. It may not seem big, but again, we really I'm always encourage again. our students, you know, if you can get that academic credit, that's a piece. Um, I encourage that because I know that the student definitely has, you know, a buy-in, you know, if they're, if they're not receiving the compensation, but we definitely encourage um, students to do all types of opportunities, whether it's paid um, or unpaid. Um, not all organizations are huge organizations. So guess what? If you can get that experience as a small organization, and then maybe a following semester or the following summer, um, you know, um, take that experience and, and go to larger organizations, that's totally okay also. Right. And, and I know like for, for a lot of organizations, including ours, when those few and far between uh, paid job opportunities come up, they always get, um, they always get offered um, to the, you know, to the current staff and volunteers. Like they're the first people that always get a chance to look at those before they go out to the public. So. Oh, yes. So any questions for Tara? You guys are going to apply for those opportunities, right? <laughs> yeah please do i mean it would be it would be a pleasure to have any any of you guys and like i said we're really super flexible at designing the program so that it meets what your interests and needs and availability is and um you know in the meantime you know check us out watch us you know watch what we're doing on facebook and instagram and check us check out our website you know if you can, you know, come down to the museum, um, be prepared to get your temperature taken, make sure you have your mask, but we are, you know, we are open. We have taken the safe clean pledge and we're, um, you know, we are one of the, one of the few, um, one of the few cultural institutions that are, that are um, open to the public right now. So come check us out and let me know if you're going to come down, let me know and I'll, and I'll, I'll try to meet you there if I can. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Tara, for your time. We greatly appreciate your assistance and, and doing this information session and all the all the hard work and, and dedication you guys have for our students. So thank you. Thank you so much, you guys. It was a pleasure seeing you today and thank you for signing up to meet with me today. <laughs> Hope to see you at History Fort Lauderdale soon. Thank you, Tara. <laughs>